Hi everyone, this is an update on the Finding Grace project that was presented at the O'Malley Clan Rally in June 2023. Now, we missed the first five minutes, so Brendan has re-recorded them, and you will see a break or hear a break in the audio after about five minutes, just to let you know. So, over to you, Brendan. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session on the Finding Grace project, which is part of the O'Malley DNA project. Um, the project is to see if we can uh, identify genetic signatures associated with Grace O'Malley and her, her immediate family uh, and, and help modern day O'Malley's to find out if they're related to her and, and just how. And the, the way that we are setting out to do this is to combine historical information with DNA analysis. Um, DNA analysis can tell you how closely or distantly two particular people or three particular people may be related to each other, but they can't provide names or, or identify specific individuals. Only the historical information can do that. Um, but the historical information, as we all know, uh, as we go further back, can often prove to be inaccurate, false, misleading, either deliberately or accidentally. Um, so the combination of the two gives us the chance of a much more accurate picture of ancestry. And the tool that we're using currently is YDNA. YDNA is inherited um, from father to son. Uh, virtually unchanged, although small var variations do occur every so often, and identifying these small variations can show specific lines of descent. Um, because it goes father to son, uh, which is the same way that surnames go, you can um, hopefully uh, follow a particular family line uh, and see how the, uh, the descent goes and whether that matches the, the record. So we started off by searching the historical record to identify living O'Malley men who we could test, um, who, who may be descended from the O'Malley men in Grace's immediate family. And as we started, we uh, got into looking at uh, what other researchers had done. And the first of those was Sir Samuel O'Malley, the first baronet who, who lived uh, in the late um, 18th century, who was born in the late 18th century and into the 19th, um, he was elected, he was an agent for Lord Sligo, um, became uh, a member of parliament in the Irish parliament and voted for the Act of Union in 1800. If anyone knows the, the history of the Act in, of Union, there was a lot of skullduggery that went on, bribes uh, of all sorts. Uh, to get people to vote for the Act of Union and therefore abolish the, uh, the separate Irish Parliament that had existed up to then. Um, Sir Samuel was, became Sir Samuel and became a baronet in 1804, just 40, four years later, um, as part of his reward. Uh, sometime, some years later, in 1833, he commissioned a pedigree um, to establish his ancestry and uh, his his um, right, I guess, to, to bear the O'Malley coat of arms and so on. And this uh, fine volume pictured here uh, showed his descent from Dermot O'Malley, who was born around 1400, the great-great-grandfather of Grace, and going back a further 19 generations to uh, Yucky Muiman, King of Connacht in the 4th century. Um, and then shows multiple branches in, in the uh, 16th century and downwards. And the original of this uh, marvellous production is now in the library of the University of Galway, and it's quite a, quite a fine production. Uh, another researcher was Sir Owen O'Malley, who had a distinguished career in the British Foreign Service, was ambassador to various places, um, and after he retired in 1947, devoted himself to O'Malley genealogy, he was probably the most scholarly of all the researchers we, uh, we investigated and uh, published several articles in, in the Galway Historical Society's journal, produced a detailed account of his branch of the family in the 16th century, this red book, which is now in the National Library in Dublin. Um, unfortunately, his particular line has died out 
So one of the best researched parts of the family tree is unfortunately has no living male descendants. He acquired Carrigahowley Castle near Newport and was instrumental in the establishment of the O'Malley Clan Association in 1947 to restore the castle. And at the castle, as you know, the very first O'Malley gathering was held in 1953. Um, Dr. Austin O'Malley of Philadelphia uh, and his uh, eminent ophthalmologist and professor of English, quite, quite a talented person at the University of Notre Dame. And he researched his O'Malley heritage on numerous visits. I hope he was a better ophthalmologist and English professor than he was a genealogist, because he seems to have been responsible for lots of confusion. And many of those mistakes have been propagated by other people and in other documents. Um, and there's some of his work in the National Library as well. Um, Major Harold O'Malley, who was uh, in the Royal Flying Corps in the First World War, and his brother, Captain Tyrrell, who I think was in the Navy, uh, were the sons of Middleton Moore O'Malley of Ross House near Newport. They had some connection to the, to the Baronets and inherited that, so it's in fact through them that we still have that earlier pedigree. And there's extensive research and correspondence that they had, and they, they wanted to be of the chieftain branch. It was very important for them to have a, a pedigree that was important um, for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, Professor Connor O'Malley of the Man Valley Kilmilkin O'Malley's in County Galway also was an ophthalmologist more recently, um, and his uh, granddaughter Sarah was, was a chieftain here a couple of years ago and, and, and was with us uh, yesterday and will be here today. And, but he perpetuated many of Dr. Austin's ideas. And finally, Dr. Sheila Malloy, who was the chieftain and garden chief, guardian chieftain of the clan, um, has published numerous stuff, but unfortunately we haven't managed to track down her, her papers. So those are the people who we, um, whose, whose work we were able to build upon. Um, this is a little bit more from that pedigree that I mentioned, I showed you at the beginning showing this, this line here of assorted O'Malley's going all the way back up at the top, or sorry, around here and up to here, which says, Brian, the eldest son of Achaeus, the 124th monarch of Ireland, who died in the year 365. But I don't know how many years you would go back <coughs> to get to uh, Achaeus, or sorry, to, to, the, to the 124 generations back. And uh, a lot of that stuff was, was more myth and legend than, than anything else. Uh, and it's only in more recent times that you begin to have some sort of historical record that would bear these out. You may notice, I know this is a bit small, but you see here somebody, there's a year killed in, I think that's 1337. So you're beginning to find references in the annals to some of these particular people. But as, as you follow that line down, 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 you come to this. Dermot O'Malley, who I mentioned a little bit earlier, who is the great-great-grandfather of Grace through a son, uh, Owen Cormac, uh, uh, Dovdara, Owen Dovdara, who was Grace's father, who married Margaret, also an O'Malley, uh, and this is Grace with her O'Flaherty and Burke husbands. Um, the, the ancestry of, you know, this line here above Grace is reasonably consistent. The different people who've written on it, historical sources and so on, largely agree. There's, there's occasional details that differ, but it's, it's not really contentious. Where things start to get complicated is as we come down. And, and maybe just as a little bit of background, in, as you get to the 15th and 16th centuries, the old tribal system which has been revived by the O'Malley's of electing a Tarnishta and the Tarnishta then su duly succeeding the chieftain. And the Tarnishta did not have to be an immediate uh, son of the previous chieftain. And they would go out, not, not to just any O'Malley, but maybe out by to third cousins or that, that sort of uh, distance. So you had kind of an oligarchy, I guess you could call it, uh, of uh, connected family 
and the next Farnisher would be chosen from among them. When the English arrived in Ireland, they originally arrived obviously in, in the 12th century, but by the time they got as far as Connacht in the 15th century, their way of taking over was to find a chieftain and say, look, we're going to come in and just kill you and your family, take your land and everything, unless you sign up for what was known as surrender and regrant. You surrender all your titles, surrender all your land to the king, or queen as it was then, Queen Elizabeth the first, uh, and then we will regrant it. We will make you the Earl or the Baron or the, the Duke or whatever it is, but you then hold that under English law and primogenitor takes over. As with any large scale change like this, you had it worked and then it didn't work and then it worked here and it didn't work there. You had people who signed up and said, oh yeah, yeah, I agree, but then went on and did their thing as they always did before and the hope it would go away. Uh, and it, there was a period of time where there was a lot of confusion. And that's where many of these records that would have been meticulously kept earlier no longer were in the same way, which is why, one of the reasons why a lot of confusion could arise. So, <laughs> please excuse the complexity of this. Uh, I, I'll just give you a sense of the, the general shape of it and then I'll zoom in <coughs> one or two pieces. This is the Dermot that we talked about, Grace's great-grandfather. So as you can see, there's a, a line of descent here. Um, the red boxes are people who we know were chieftains of the clan. This is Grace herself, from Owen Dara, Cormac, up, up that line. And these are some other people who were in that part of the family. Uh, over here, um, you have lines of descent down this way down this way, but of course you have arguments and confusion over individuals. So this particular Edward of Carn Mart may or may not have been an Edward, son of Melachlin. Uh, Melachlin in turn, uh, Dr. Austin put him as a brother of Grace's, and it's fairly clear that that was wrong. Uh, there's another theory that says he's actually a first cousin of Grace's, that his father was, was uh, Dermot. There was another view that the O'Malley's of Galway, Kilmilken and Man, the Man Valley, were descended from the same Dermot, um, and I think that's unlikely to be true. We had a confusion between this Owen and this Owen, courtesy of Dr. Austin once more, and we have the, the Ballyburke O'Malley's, Edmund Bacock, which means lame, uh, of Clare Island, being confused with an Edmund Oak son of Edmund of Cahar Mar. So, I hope you're as confused about this as, uh, as, as many others are. But uh, just a couple of points to, to make. Um, actually, I won't, I won't go through a lot of the detail, but there's a couple of key people that are worth remembering. So what Morris and I were doing, we're trying to make sense of these connections, but also to follow them downwards as I said, to, to find more O'Malley men uh, that we can get into the program. So we got a lot of these people, the Kilmilken, Man Valley, uh, O'Malley's, and they, many of them tested that we have quite a lot of interesting information that Morris will tell you about. This is the line uh, the, of, down from uh, Captain Thomas O'Malley uh, to Ackill Island, there was an, uh, a Taig of Akil who married a Mary McSweeney. Uh, so that's a line, we have some testers there. And we have the, the Ross House line, I mentioned Ross House uh, near Newport, so we have some of them. And over this side, a key person is this red box here, Owen of Borishul, who's essentially the last of the old Gaelic style chieftains of the O'Malley clan. So the line of chieftainship went from from here to here to here, over to here. Possibly him, but not quite clear whether he actually was formally made chieftain or not. And then to here, to Owen of Borishu. And then we have descendants of his from, uh, from Valley Park in, in Eastern Mayo. What day, what day is he? Uh, Owen of Borishu was born around 1650. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's the broad shape of it. And 
you know, as we followed uh, different lines, like Grace's brother, Donald Napiva, here, we couldn't find any any uh, trace of, of them. We, we kicked down a generation or two, but not, not very much. Um, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. That's that's basically it. I mean, that's that's the story. There's, there's, there's a lot of digging went into that, and uh, down each of these green lines, we uh, we we follow various records and, and so on to see many of them second hand, so you never know whether they're just perpetuating somebody else's mistake or not. But anyway, that's that's broadly the picture. So I leave. So uh, Brendan, uh, sure. Grace's mother was also an O'Malley. So That's right, Margaret. And therefore, there could be descendants from that male line of Grace's grandfather on the O'Malley side, as opposed to indeed, the indeed, side. there could be, and that's not something we found yeah. any any record of. But uh, yes, and uh, we'll talk at the end about about other possible lines that we might uh, we might follow. And do you want to say a few words about the papers in the National University of Ireland in Galway and your experiences of uh, perusing these papers? Well, it, uh, it, I, I glossed over that earlier. <laughs> 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 the, the, um, it's amazing how things like this could get contentious. Um, we had a number of O'Malley's, and, and it appears to have been something to do with the Order of Malta because. Several of them were involved in the Order of Malta, and apparently, to get to the senior, senior level in the Order of Malta is, at least in those days, I don't know if that's still the case, was necessary to have some form of aristocratic pedigree. So not just anyone could be a, a knight commander or whatever the title is in, in the Order of Malta. So finding this pedigree was very important, and for several of these people, that was the motivation of getting dug into it. But you also had in the Irish, uh, with, with, with Irish independence in 1920, one of the very last institutions that was run from London uh, that was handed over to the Irish state was the, what is now the genealogical office and was then the chief herald's office, which didn't actually happen until the early 1930s, 10 years after independence. Uh, so you had, around that time, uh, particularly Major Harold and his brother, engaging with the new regime in the genealogical office and taking issue with what they said and going back to England to see if they could get the old regime and, and pitting one against the other to try and get the result they wanted, essentially. And there are some quite vitriolic letters in, in the file that are, that are well worth reading on that subject. <laughs> And they took great issue with Sir Owen as well, although I think they were later uh, reconciled, uh, who's probably one of the, the most scholarly, oh, excuse me, I meant to turn this off, the most scholarly of the researchers uh, who were there. Uh, but anyway, that's, uh, that was one of the more entertaining sides of the search. Two words. Good, good, good. Well, thanks very much for that, Brandon. Brendan, because Brendan's done a huge amount of work in the archives, and that's the kind of work that we need to do with this particular project, if we have any hope of finding grace and really uh, validate, you know, having validated genealogies that are consistent with the DNA. So we have this wonderful chart here, this pedigree chart, that kind of summarizes a huge amount of information from Dermot in 1400 up to maybe say the late, seven, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s here. And I have something similar. Um, this is your last slide. In oh, fact, sorry. Might, might as well speak to that. Yeah, essentially what we're saying, we're, to continue it, we're, we're uh, trying to prove as far as possible the, the junior, the line, as Morris said. Uh, doing big Y tests on more of the people identified in group 3A, uh, which is the simpler test identifies which sort of subgroup people fall into and it's all of the ones that we found have come from group 3A so they're the people we need to do the more detailed tests and identify more people with potential to send to, to test and to raise funds to subsidize the password load because the big Y test is, is of the order of 
three hundred and eighty four hundred dollars. So it's, yeah, it's, it's not expensive. Yeah. So most people who've done these tests have paid for this themselves uh, out of their own interest in, in this activity. Uh, but we found some people who weren't in a position to do that, so having some funds to help subsidize them has been quite helpful. So, great. So, uh, and on that note, a very big thank you to Gozat, to everybody who's actually done one of the big Y tests. It is not an inexpensive test, and it is quite an investment. Um, so we have had a lot of generosity from people within the project, and also for people uh, giving donations and allowing us to uh, subsidize uh, people who were um, maybe sitting on the fence until a little bit of money was, was offered to help subsidize their testing for the benefit of all O'Malley's. And as a result of that, what we have created is actually a very, very nice branching structure for the Mayo O'Malley's, if you like, a genetic family tree for the Mayo O'Malley's. And the big question is, what happens when we superimpose the genetic family tree on top of the genealogical family tree? Do we see consistencies? Do we see inconsistencies? And how do we interpret what we are seeing? So this is the ex uh, exciting part uh, from the DNA point of view. Um, just to recap, this is from um, uh, and the Chamber's biography of Grace O'Malley, and at the very, very top here you have, uh, well, you have Grace here, who married Donald O'Flaherty, married Richard Burke, uh, Grace's father was Owen Dodara, his father was Cormac, his father was Owen, and Dermot sits just above that, uh, well, I have it in the slide, but it's gone, it sits just up there, born around about 1400, 1450, that type of time point. And we have O'Flaherty ancestors, or descendants, coming down here into the 1800s. And we have Burke descendants coming down here. And of course, some of those descendants were the Brown family of Westport House. And uh, those of you who were in the church yesterday, on the right-hand side, as we were listening to the Grace O'Malley suite, all of Grace's descendants uh, from the Brown family were memorialized on those lovely little plaques on the wall to the right. So I really got a sense that Grace O'Malley uh, was actually there last night with us, listening to the music that had been composed in her honor. So this is how all the O'Malley's are related genetically. And uh, this really just summarizes everybody in the project. And we've got well over 135 people in the project who have done DNA testing at this point in time. And all of us are connected. You know, if you go back far enough, everybody here is going to be a cousin to everybody else here in the room. And uh, the, the common ancestor to everyone who has tested so far is this person up here uh, who lived about 47,000 years ago. <laughs> so uh, we're not going to have records that go that far back. But it just makes the point that we are all connected just by virtue of our humanity. The interesting thing is that you have the uh, Mayo O'Malley's right here. This is the largest group in the project, over 35 people at this point in time. And they go back to this person here who carried this SNP marker DF-105, and he would have been related to Nile of the Nine hostages, who was um, an O'Neill and who was very prominent in Northwest Ireland. And that is exactly where we are right now. We are in the land of the nine, <coughs> nine hostages. And he is reported to have had many uh, children, and they, of course, had descendants of their own. And one of those descendants is uh, the O'Malley clan of Mayo. If you move over this line, you get to Brian Beru, who fought the Vikings at Tontarf and died there in 1014 at the age of 78 or so. And the Limerick O'Malley's are related to Brian Baru. They would be distant cousins of Brian Baru. So within the larger O'Malley clan, we've got two very prominent ancestors or relatives that if we go far back far enough, we will find a connection to them. So those of you who are male O'Malley's may be uh, fifth cousins 27 times removed for Nile of the Nine hostages. <laughs> and those of you uh, in the Limerick O'Malley's might be um, seventh cousins 12 times removed to Brian Baru. 
Those are the kind of fissures we're looking at. Now, uh, yes, that was the, the, the steps in the Finding Grace project were, first of all, to identify extensive lineages, as Brenda mentioned. Um, we tried to use these validated pedigrees from the genealogical office, the ones that uh, Brandon showed you. Uh, we also used um, Glycis, uh, Betham, Berksland and Gentry. Uh, also has a lot of information on O'Malley's who had claimed some kind of aristocratic uh, descent. Uh, there were also private collections, and all of this data was entered into the O'Malley clan family tree, which is publicly available on Ancestry. And a lot of you uh, will have seen that. A lot of you will also have had your uh, family included in the, the O'Malley clan family tree. We then traced living descendants on the direct male line, father, 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 starting with Dermot, born about 1400, Grace's great-great-grandfather, and that uh, genealogical research and outreach work was done by myself, by Brendan, by Emer Gunter, and also by Tom O'Malley. Uh, so it was really a group effort, and that is a very important point to make, that this O'Malley DNA project is very, very much a group effort and involves a lot of um, discourse and conversation with project members. We then tested these descendants, these reported descendants, uh, using uh, specially negotiated prices uh, with Family Tree DNA, who is the company that supplies these Y DNA tests. And the funding was either provided by people themselves, the manager of the kit, we have a general fund in the project, but also the clan association has been very uh, generous with, with providing a little bit of, of uh, uh, money. We've also applied for research grants to the Heritage Council of Ireland, but the Heritage Council of Ireland do not do DNA uh, heritage. We Butterflies, bats, and... <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, uh, they, the Heritage Council didn't know what genetic heritage was until we asked for the grant. There was no policy on the subject. There is now. It's no. Courtesy of the O'Malley. So we really screwed ourselves there. Uh, so, um, and then the fourth step in this project is to be to validate each lineage. You know, a lot of the the information we have is not validated to current standards. And of course, a lot of the pedigrees that were produced by the genealogical office. They didn't include all the sources and all the birth records and all the marriage records. They just said, this is what it is. But now we need to, to the current standards are we need to check our information and see if uh, there is definitely a valid genealogy going all the way back. So let's look at steps one to three first of all. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this chair and sit down so that I, my head is out of the way and you guys can see what I'm doing. Um, so, have to do this what, we, what we have here is the various lines of, of these 13 living descendants. And here we have three people from the Ross House O'Malley's. We also had uh, two people from the Ackle uh, O'Malley's that Brendan mentioned in his uh, slides. We uh, didn't find anyone who was descended from Tighe, who was a brother of Grace O'Malley, um, because that line died out in 1897. Uh, similarly, with Donald Apiba, his ancestors, his descendants, disappeared from the record after about three generations. So he was known as Donald with the Pipes because he liked playing music. Um, and I guess because he wasn't a warrior, his descendants really didn't figure very much in the whole scheme of things. He was never made chief of the O'Malley clan. Uh, whether he has any descendants living today, we don't know. Uh, so those were two lives that ended fairly abruptly. Then we have the Kilmilken O'Malley's, who are descended from Dermot in 1490, who was an uncle of uh, Grace O'Malley, a brother of her father, owned of Dara. And we had six people testing from the Kilmilken line. And then over here on the uh, far uh, right, you have the Bally Burke line. And they go back to Owen of Burr in 1650. And we had two people testing from that particular line. So we called them line one, line two, and line three. And the first people to actually 
uh, have the results come back were the Kilmilken O'Malley's of line two. And what this showed was that they all matched each other. So you can see the, uh, the, the blue ones are the ones that did the big Y test, and they all matched each other. They shared the same DNA marker with this very sexy name, FTC36168, letters and numbers standard. Um, but it showed that they were all closely related to each other. The only problem was they weren't related to group 3A, which is the majority of the male O'Malley's. And this suggested either that um, there had been some kind of DNA switch, perhaps. You know, maybe there had been a secret adoption or illegitimacy or infidelity or a legal name change somewhere along the way. And the family took the mother's O'Malley name because she was higher social prestige than the husband. So there could have been any uh, number of reasons for why there was a DNA switch, but it also raised the possibility that the genealogy was incorrect. So that kind of put a spanner in the works to start off with. The next ones to come back were the Ross House O'Malley's, and uh, we had two people doing the test here, and they came back uh, with, uh, first of all, the Y37 results, which showed that they definitely belonged to group 3A. So we have group 3G with the, uh, with the Kilmilken O'Malley's. Now we're finding people where we expect to find them, in group 3A, the majority of the Mayo O'Malley's, um, and that was very hopeful. And then while we were waiting for their big Y results, the upgraded results to come back, we tested one of the Ackle Island uh, O'Malley's, and they came back as a completely different DNA signature, completely. Um, which meant basically that there wasn't a genetic connection between that particular person and the other people within this particular group, the other 13 descendants. Uh, so there had been a DNA switch somewhere there. Uh, we got the big Y results then for the first person in uh, line one in the Ross House O'Malley's over there on the left hand side. Where's he gone? Oh, I've lost it for a second. Um, and the next one to test was one of the um, Valley Burke O'Malley's. And this came back again as being group 3A, which was really useful when we got the initial results. And the further big Y results came back and they showed that they belonged to um, the group FTC 67000. So that we just did there, which is that one there. And that was the same as the Ross House O'Malley's. So this was a really exciting result. It showed that line one and line three were indeed related to each other and shared the same DNA marker. And the big question at that stage was, when you trace the line of ascent to the common ancestor for these two that passed on this specific DNA marker, FTC 67000, was it Dermot um, Grace's great-great-grandfather? That was the question. Is that where they're connected? So the next one to test was another one of the Valley Burke ones over here on the, uh, yeah, this one here. And his big Y results came back, and he also was an exact match to uh, uh, the other Valley Burke O'Malley, and also uh, shares this same DNA marker with the Line 1 Ross House O'Malley's. Um, and in addition to that, those two uh, cousins down here, these two first cousins, shared an additional DNA marker just between themselves, which is what you'd expect. You know, as the DNA gets passed down generation after generation, a little, another DNA marker forms and that gets passed down to the descendants. And then some of those descendants will have another DNA marker that gets passed down to their descendants. So you get this accumulation of these various DNA markers over time. Now, uh, more of a story for sure. you. Sure, please, please. Who are, who are the Valley Burke um, line? Who are, who are they? Who are they? Right, okay. Do you want to answer that? They're um, the, the people in a number of villages in, in eastern Mayo. Um, none of them major landholders land or owners um, in, involved in different modern day professions. We, we don't talk about individuals in this in the sense of saying so and so. 
uh, has done a test, and this is what the result is. That that's private information, obviously. Um, but in terms of uh, of that, they they can very definitely trace their descent from one or Shul, who had, I think, it was five sons, and down through all of the other lines, they all died out. So this is one line that that has actually had. In fact, I think one of them was um, was a postmaster um, somewhere in, in Eastern Mayor. Yeah. <coughs> around the Ballon Road area? Yeah, uh, I, there were other O'Malley's in Ballon Road, but they're not the same ones. Not the same ones, right. And the Ballet Burke, a, a town? It's a town land. Town land. Yeah. Near? Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly. I know it was Eastern Mayo somewhere. Okay. And also, one of the Ballet Burke O'Malley's uh, was Connor O'Malley's mother, Professor Connor. Oh. Um, of the oh. O'Malley's. He had, his father was was the Kazakhian O'Malley's, but his mother was a Valley Park O'Malley. So you have you have these kind of cross linkages as well. But there's fairly well documented uh, information that goes back to Ola Per Shul, and uh, these were some of his other descendants. But you can see the Captain George the Smuggler, um, yeah. who wrote a lovely big tome, um, which was passed from pillar to post and. Copied surreptitiously. It, it was far too outrageous to be published. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, mm. it would have been uh, like what's the Pantic rule? Uh, it was very revelation. Put it that way. There's a lot of um, you know seaside humour. Put it that way in that particular tone. Um, but there, and another line down here. Uh, this one here died out in 1903. So with some of these lines, we actually had just missed the last direct male descendant, which was very frustrating. You're thinking, I'm, I'm going to get, he, have a son, have a son. No, we have five daughters. And there's no Y DNA from, from the five daughters. So can we, can we dig them up? <laughs> no, that's a very good question. Um, technically, yes. The question is, should we? You know, I think we, we could. Um, the question is, should we? So that is a very interesting question, but certainly they, uh, I was chatting last night uh, about this, you know, they, they found a medieval town in Ranelagh, County Roscommon, a couple of years ago, uh, while they were building the motorway, they excavated the entire town and they found 800 skeletons there, and they are testing those skeletons. And those people would have died between, say, 500, 600 AD and 1300 AD, 1300 AD enters the period of surnames, so we might actually be able to ascribe certain surnames to some of those individuals in that medieval city. So the whole area of genetic genealogy is just going to get more and more exciting as time goes on. As a supplementary then, sure. this is all based on the Y. So it's based on the male. On the male, that's right, what, yes. What would happen if you and Brendan decided to start another project? Well, I've lost right. all my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and do it from the female line. That is something that we could do, looking at mitochondrial DNA. The big problem with the female line is that because uh, Ireland was a patriarchal society, the men were recorded and the women were generally less well recorded than the men. As a result of that, it is going to be potentially very difficult to trace a female line from Grace O'Malley through her daughter, through her daughter, through her daughter, 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 all the way down to the present day, but not impossible. Um, the other big problem is that those tests will cost $139, whereas the Y-DNA tests cost $79, so there's the cost factor coming in there as well. But there is no reason why we uh, shouldn't do that type of research and also include it in an annual update for the O'Malley clan, tracing both the father, father, father line and also the mother, mother, mother line. Um, so that would definitely be a possibility. The other possibility, of course, is looking at autosomal DNA, which is all of your chromosomes, not just the Y chromosome, not just the mitochondrial DNA, all of your chromosomes, all 46 of them, the Y is only one of those, and try to rebuild some of the uh, genetic <coughs> signature of descendants of Grace O'Malley that way. The trouble with that is it only goes back about 200, 250 years. And Grace, of course, 
is almost 500 years old now. So it would be difficult to rebuild Grace's genetic signature, but not impossible because they have done it with someone in Iceland who was the only African to become a merchant in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And he had children, and now anyone in Iceland who has African DNA as part of their DNA test mm -hmm. is related to that single African man who landed in Iceland in the early 1800s. And they have been able to rebuild um, that portion of his genome. So we've actually mm -hmm. been able to rebuild part of someone from the early 1800s. Could we do it with Grace O'Malley? Come back in 50 years and ask me that. <laughs> <laughs> so what were the results of this endeavor so far? Um, we also tested one of the ACL people, another of the ACL people, and they came back, and as did uh, another of their um, first cousins, as being a, um, a, a match, if you like, uh, to each other, but totally different from uh, the Ross House O'Malley's. And this simply indicates that they are not connected genetically to the Ross House O'Malley's, and therefore there is some kind of error in the reported genealogies. Now, this is not the only error in reported genealogies. Because one of the things that Family Tree DNA uh, introduced last year was this Discover feature. And they have been able to give us much more precise estimates for the age of the ancestors on each of the lines in the genetic family tree that we've generated for the O'Malley's. And this is, now this comes with a caveat, because when I say precise, I mean from a statistical point of view, not from a genealogical point of view. From a statistical point of view, it's precise, and you've got a 200-year margin on either side of the estimate. From a genealogical point of view, that is rubbish. You know, we want to know, was it the grandfather or was it the great-grandfather? And the statisticians are coming back saying, well, it could be any, anyone in, these, in this 400-year period. That's your 95% confidence interval. And sadly, we're not going to get much more precise than that. But what we do have is this central estimate, which is very enticing, but it has to be interpreted with a huge amount of caution, because you probably see the error bars, the, the range on either side of that, spanning several hundred years. But what we can say is that uh, the majority of the people in the male Mali group, group 3A, they all descend, they're all on the same branch. Now there's a couple of stragglers on either, you know, who are connected a little bit further back, but there's only one or two individuals. But the majority of the O'Malley clan is actually descended from somebody who carried this DNA marker up here, FT86146, and the best estimate we have for when he lived was about 1260, middle of the 1200s. Why are most people sitting on a single branch? Is this the royal line, and is it the reason they have so many descendants is because the royalty is going to be more successful at surviving than the more common people on the side. So these are the, the, the data estimates for the age of these particular uh, ancestors that passed on these DNA markers to their specific descendants. But the one of interest for us is this one down here. And these, these are also uh, descendant lines of FT86146, this patriarch, O'Malley patriarch. And over here, um, we have the line one Ross House O'Malley's, and that is their DNA signature there. The, this is the line three, Valley Burke O'Malley's, and what the DNA is telling us is that they are connected by an ancestor who lived about 1670. Now Dermot, who was supposed to be their common ancestor, lived in 1400. So what we're seeing here is that the DNA is suggesting that the genealogies are incorrect, and that line one and line three do not connect at 1400, they're connecting much later on. They have a common ancestor who was born in the mid 1600s. So that is another inconsistency between the genealogical record and the genetic record. 
And when we superimpose the two on top of each other, we're saying that's inconsistent. Why? Is line one wrong? Is the genealogy for line three wrong? Or are both of them wrong? And that's the question that the DNA is actually challenging us with. Just one point sure, as far as on that. The, the Valley Burke uh, O'Malley is a reasonably well documented as descending from all O'Malley of Borishul, who was born in 1650, which is not a bad fit to a common ancestor born in 1670 or in, in yeah, the region no. of 1670. Yeah, plus or minus 100 years. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and that, that is, that is the, you know, an obvious question. So the, the temptation is to say, well, that's all a for a truth. Yes. It may or may not be, but there are a lot of O'Malley's, there's a reasonable chance that it might be. A lot of O'Malley's were living around about 1670. Yeah. You know, um, so it could have been any of those. Uh, but there is some common ancestor there uh, that connects those two lines. Now, we also have what I call the Michigan O'Malley's. Uh, this is Paul, Paul uh, McLaughlin's uh, group and Fred Good and um, various other people are descended from, from Gramps. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about him later on. And we have the Milu, the Milu family. And Milu is a variation of uh, O'Malley because their ancestor uh, was John Melia, born about 1816. Uh, the DNA suggests he was born about 1793, which is in the same ballpark as 1816. The Michigan O'Malley's, their common ancestor was 1867. The DNA is saying around about 1810, again, the same ballpark, but it gives you an idea of how the DNA estimate can be out by 50, at least 50 years, 60 years, that type of thing. Um, and uh, the Michigan O'Malley's and the Milu O'Malley's are connected by a common ancestor born about 1532, and they're related to the Ross House and Valley Burke O'Malley's by this chap up here, born about 1426, is this dirt? That's the question that the DNA is challenging us with now. And are we actually looking at uh, the DNA signature for Grace's great-great-grandfather in this particular DNA signature here, DNA marker, FTA 85293. We also mentioned the Ackle Island O'Malley's, they are connected even further back at 1264. They're not related to these other ones, uh, certainly since uh, Dermot's time, 1400. They actually share a common ancestor going much further back. So again, the DNA is saying, they, this does not match the genealogy, and it's yet another inconsistency. So, quick question for sure. you, you may go on this later. What if your common ancestor, because I've done the big Y test, what if your common ancestor isn't until all the way back to 1250. Okay. Like I don't have nothing in common with anybody else. Right, My okay. Most common is 1250. Right, okay. What basically it means is that you are currently the only person sitting on your specific branch of the tree of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to see that as a result. <laughs> But, you know, if you were to test your brother, hint, hint. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Hey, listen, we got the grandfather here. Oh, right. okay, okay. We got four generations. Got four generations. You have four generations here. Right. Okay, well, welcome. I saw that on the um, on the post. And yeah. if you're, uh, I'll have to talk to you about getting your Irish passport. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we'll be we'll having a little chat about that. Um, that'll be a result from the O'Malley clan rally. So we have one tree range. We got one so if, if you do test, Anyone else in the family, you know, any other male, then you will find that you are not alone of your branch, and your particular branch will then have a uh, an additional SNP marker. Okay. Because uh, you probably have a lot of uh, unique SNPs. You might have seven or eight of them that are just unique to you currently, because nobody else from your immediate family has done the test. But as soon as one of your family does the test, they'll share some of those unique SNPs that you. Have currently, and they won't be unique anymore. Okay. They'll be shared with another person, and that will bring your line down date-wise to a more recent common ancestor who will have been born around about 1850. Uh, the, the real challenge, if, if at all possible, if there's any way of researching, say, back to your great, great, great. So we, we have done our own independent yeah. research, and I mean, we 
do trace back to Thomas O'Malley, who was born uh, in Limerick, um, in Autumnstown. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, we could trace that and actually been the house. But anyway, we could trace back that far on paper. But of course, prior to that, well, it's a little muddled. There are quite a lot of O'Malley's in Autumnstown, where there is a separate genetic group from the other O'Malley's in the region. So the person to talk to here is Dennis O'Malley. Uh, if you can track him down, it's quite Dennis. Raise your hand. Dennis, 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 Dennis is somebody to talk to. Yes. Likely, Sorry. Likely, likely to be a good one. Likely to be a good one. But no, that's a good question because, you know, and it, I welcome those kind of questions because it is, you know, I'm trying to summarize a huge amount of information in just a small amount of time. Um, so it's good to get those kind of questions. So coming back to this chart, <coughs> this is how it now looks after the DNA is superimposed on it. Sure, that's clear. Uh, so what we're seeing here is that the two Bally Burke O'Malley, so go back to Owen Burnshul in 1650, share this DNA marker here, FTC 67000, with the Ross House O'Malley's, who are descended from Middleton Moore O'Malley, mm -hmm. and from where you get the Blackwells and uh, um, Ari, who is here but he's not here in the room today, um, they used to play in Westport House as children. You know, so they're very, very closely uh, closely associated with the Brown family. The Ackle Island O'Malley's, who were supposed to be part of Line One, connecting up here around about 1655 with Tig. Interesting how 1665 is quite close to 1670, you know? They do not connect with these guys at all. You have to go back and up to 1264 before they actually have a common ancestor with all of the other ones. And uh, this chap here, 1426, is this Dermot? And do the Michigan O'Malley's and the Milu? family also descend from, they descend from this ancestor, but is this ancestor Dermot? If it is Dermot, then anyone who has this DNA marker is a descendant of Grace O'Malley's great-great-grandfather. And they will either be first cousins, second cousins, or third cousins, 12 times removed to Grace O'Malley's. So that's where we currently are. In the, the front of yes, question at the back. Um, so I can't fully see it. My father uh, died from a man and he passed away, but he was a chieftain, and then my grandfather, my other man, was a chieftain mm -hmm. as well on my father's side. Now I think there might be more lines on your board because my mother is also a man as well. But my parents, I would always say jokingly to my friends, oh, I'm not inbred. But now looking at this, I think I definitely <laughs> <laughs> um, My mother's side of family, they were all from Balmullet, um, Black Sod area. So I'm not sure where they would put in on this, but I'm definitely going to get my brother to do to yes. so try to get some more things in there. Excellent. Now that would be really, really good. Um, what we've only done on this chart is, is looked at 13 reported descendants of Dermot O'Malley, Grace's great great grandfather because we weren't able to identify any more than that currently. But hopefully over time, we will be able to identify other surviving direct male line descendants. And that is going to be part of the, uh, the, the next steps. Are we almost ready? We, we've we just had a five to 10 minutes. Five minute warning, warning for round. Uh, the next steps, identify more descendants and test them, triangulate back as far as possible, and then we need to do the validation. You know, go into the records and try and validate every single line I'll just uh, summarize this by saying we've tested those 13 living descendants on, uh, we, we, uh, on three lines. We weren't able to identify the Clunan line, but there might still be some O'Malley's in Island 80 who descend from this particular individual. And the hope is that maybe just we get a rogue tester coming in that kind of reveals a huge amount of information that allows us a breakthrough. The same for Donald and Pippa, they disappeared. Uh, line one and three do share a common ancestor. It's not likely to be Dermot, born in 1400. It's most likely to be somebody in the mid to late 1600s. Validation of the pedigrees is in progress, and further big Y testings will also refine these age estimates. 
Now, wouldn't it be great if Grace and Nanny had done a DNA test herself and would have saved us all of this trouble? But what I feel is that in the same way that she was able to navigate through all of the islands in Clue Bay and elude and evade the English, she's doing exactly the same thing today with the DNA. And she's really trying to evade and elude our uh, best efforts to isolate her genetic signature. Now, um, we talked about uh, Michigan O'Malley's, this is Paul McLaughlin from Michigan. He has provided us with a digital copy of this book written by his grandfather, Charles O'Malley, who was born in 1867. And that is going to be available as part of a digital archive, which Jerry, you were mentioning yesterday, going to be available as part of the, uh, an expanding digital archive on the uh, O'Malley clan website. So that will be coming in due course. And lastly, there will be DNA kits available on Clare Island. Where better to test your DNA than under the, the cover of the castle of Grace O'Malley uh, as a, a, in deference to her, her continuing legacy. And we've got specially negotiated prices for that. Um, which would you prefer people to get? Um, I Obviously, a big wine, but sure. I would start with Y thirty seven to make sure there aren't any surprises in the family, and then upgrade oh, yeah. to the big Y afterwards. <laughs> you know? Or if you want to take that big risk, just go straight to the big Y, and we will plunk you on that genetic family tree. Another question here, uh, Mars John Ilya. Uh, I'm not that Ilya, but uh, I show up as FTB seven eight three. 75385. Okay, I didn't show I know I'm group 3A. Sure, sure. It but will be somewhere up there. I don't know what I am. I will <laughs> at 37 grounds and birds go on the case. Yeah, yeah, well. And then when I get to the I'm pure O'Melia, rather. I'm pure O'Melia when we get to 111. Let's have a chat about that later on. And if anyone else has any questions, I'll go to Clare Island for the next two days. Uh -huh.